Welcome to the first of two videos on Gauss's law. Um, so in this video, we're going to do, we're going to talk about two um, different different things. Uh, so first of all, what good is symmetry uh, and then electric flux? So these things don't seem related at all at first. So we'll talk separately about these two things. And then we'll start uh, combining these two things by talking about the actual Gauss's law, so the actual formula. We'll basically end this video there and then pick it up again in the next video where we again talk about Gauss's law, the formula, and then get to this stuff. This will be next video, uh, applications of Gauss's law, and then how Gauss's law applies to conductors. So the first of those two unrelated things was symmetry. Uh, so Gauss's law will be useful in cases where the charge distribution is symmetric, and that can mean a lot of different things. And your book uh, mentions some of the types of symmetry. Uh, so as an example, imagine you had an infinite line of charge. So here we just draw a section of a, of a line charge, but really this is infinitely long. And if that's true, you can think about some restrictions on the form that the electric field can take. So for example, your book's trying to explain why this electric field would be impossible. Uh, and so what they're asking you to do is think about uh, a reflection about a vertical uh, plane that is, so it's going vertical and it's also passing through the screen. So, so that's what this, this dotted line is right here. So if you were to reflect everything about that, the charge distribution doesn't change. So like this piece of the rod will go to over here and vice versa, but that doesn't actually change the rod because it's infinitely long. So we say that the charge distribution has a reflection symmetry about this reflection plane. Um, but if you imagine doing that to the electric field, then the electric, this electric field vector would go to over here. And this is a contradiction, you know, does the electric field point this way or does it point up and to the left? So if you undergo a symmetry, if you, if you perform a symmetry operation that leaves the charge distribution invariant, untouched, uh, you know, it remains the same, but it modifies the electric field, then you get a contradiction. And so you go back and you say, well, the electric field couldn't have looked like that in the first place. And this isn't the only symmetry operation that would rule out this electric field. So another way of thinking of this is imagine you took, you grabbed, um, well, actually you don't need to do anything. You just have to, <laughs> you leave the, the screen alone. You leave the piece of paper of your book alone and you turn around 180 degrees. You just look, look at this thing upside down. If you did that, uh, what happens is actually the, you get this picture again. So, so you get this picture whether you reflect about that vertical plane or if you just rotate the charge distribution 180 degrees. So, so if you took the infinite rod and you rotate it at 180 degrees, again, that leaves the charge distribution invariant. You know, uh, uh, it remains the same. But what you've done is you've rotated the electric field from, so this one that was pointing this way, when you rotate it, it goes like this. So again, this is a contradiction. The electric field can't both point both up and right right here and up and left right there. So again, you're getting this contradiction. So your book is, is getting used to these ideas uh, so that you can quickly deduce that for, a, for an infinite line charge, it has to, the, the electric field lines have to point radially away from the line charge. It can't have any uh, as mutual component, uh, which is what your book gets at right here. And it can't have any Z component, for, which is what we were talking about before uh, in, in cylindrical coordinates. Uh, yeah, so so again, we're going to have to pause this. Uh, well, let me mention one thing quickly, but but then we're going to switch gears and talk about electric flux. Um, so there are three symmetries that we're going to revisit over and over uh, about a lot in this chapter, but then again, occasionally in, in, in future sections. Um, and these three symmetries are basically, uh, so there's a 2D type of symmetry, there's a 1D type of symmetry, and there's a 3D type of symmetry. So um, what we're probably most useful, we're used to uh, so far is the spherical symmetry. So if you have a single point charge, you know that the electric field has to point radially away. It doesn't make sense for it to point in any other direction. You know, again, you can figure that out from the, these symmetry operations. Uh, and then for 1D symmetry, which an infinite line charge or an infinite cylinder uh, would be the charge distribution. For those cases, the, the electric field has to point radially away. And for an infinite plane of charge, the electric field has to point in the normal direction, either away or towards the plane. It, it doesn't make sense for it to point in any other direction. Okay, pause that part. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that next video. 
the next seemingly unrelated thing is something called electric flux. And what flux is, is how much it's, it's keeping track of how much electric field, how much E field uh, passes through a surface, passes through a surface. That's basically the idea here. We're trying to quantify this. Um, so, um, so there are a couple things here. So, uh, let me hold off on the closed surfaces. Uh, let me come back. Let me let me go to calculating electric flux first, and then so I'm actually going to do this section, and then I'll go back to twenty four point two. Um, so notice how, like in this picture, the electric field is passing straight through the hoop. And there is electric flux. There's a non-zero value of electric flux for figure A. For figure B, though, there's a surface. There's this loop that's that has uh, the loop is parallel to the electric field. The, the loop is like in this plane, and the electric field is just kind of passing alongside. But it's not the electric field isn't actually passing through the loop. So we say that the flux is zero for this one. So the flux we use this symbol. It's a capital phi, another one, another Greek letter. So sometimes you'll see a, a subscript E for electric flux, because uh, we're going to talk about magnetic flux, you know, in the second half of, of, of um, this course. So you might see it without the E, you might see it with the E. Uh, they both mean the same thing for now. This is electric flux. And the electric flux, and actually I'm going to label this, this is for uh, B. This electric flux is zero, but this electric flux, for example, A, is non-zero. Um, so really, it depends on um, it depends on the, the amount of the flux is going to depend on how strong the electric field is, how big the area of the loop is, and the relative orientation. Right? There's no difference between these two things other than the orientation of the loop in this external field. So it depends on E, A, and the angle between the electric field and the normal vector. This is an uh, angle between the electric field direction and the normal vector direction. So in other words, if you're, you're calculating the flux through a uh, some 2D surface, which has a normal direction. Right? It has two normal directions, but the it doesn't matter which one you choose for this cosine theta, at least for open surfaces. But that, that's, a, that's another issue that I want to come back to for closed surfaces. Um, so for this, like this right here, the normal direction is this way, the electric field direction is this way. Uh, and so these two vectors are perpendicular to each other, and cosine of 90 degrees is zero, which is which explains why the, the flux is zero right there. So calculating the electric flux, you can use uh, these formulas right here, and it's equivalent to this. So the dot product between two, two vectors is the magnitude of one times the magnitude of the other times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. And then this is an example going over going over that. Going back to the previous section. Um, there's there's an additional thing we want you to know about flux. Uh, okay, so 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 another thing um, has to do with closed surfaces. So what's the difference between an open surface and a closed surface? It it all has to do with whether the surface encloses a volume or not. So think about if you have a surface, think about is there an inside and an outside? If there is an inside and an outside, then you have a closed surface. So these boxes right here look like they're closed surfaces. The previous this loop right here, there was no inside or outside, right? It, it was like a sheet of paper. It, it's not separating the world into two pieces, inside and outside. So that would be an open surface. Gauss's law, when we get to it, is going to be a statement about closed surfaces. So we're going to focus more so on closed surfaces. And for a closed surface, when you choose the normal direction to us to your surface, to part of this, so like for the box, you can imagine calculating the flux for all six sides separately. And then the total flux would be the, the sum of those six. For each of those, there's a unique normal vector direction that points out of the box. So you so for a closed surface, you're going to choose the normal vector to point out of the box. Any electric field that's going out of your closed surface is going to be a positive flux. And any electric field that's entering your closed surface is a negative flux. So now we can start to ascribe uh, meaning to the sign of the flux. And what this picture is trying to get at is that, well, it looks like, okay, so here it looks like there's a positive flux. This one, it looks like there's a negative flux. And here it looks like there's no overall flux. There's a positive flux for this part, this side, there's a negative flux for this side, and it looks like they can cancel out. 
So positive, negative, or zero flux. And that's going to be related to the fact that there's an overall positive charge here. There's an overall negative charge inside the this box, and there's no charge in here. And this is, in essence, what Gauss's law is all about. It relates the net charge inside a closed surface to the amount of flux that's going through the closed surface that's on the boundary between the inside and the outside. So these surfaces don't have to be physical things. There doesn't actually have to be a box there. You can imagine a box surrounding a charge. It, it's, it can be an imaginary surface, and we give a name to this. It's called a Gaussian surface. So not necessarily, it could be a real thing, but it doesn't have to be. So real or imaginary surface, a Gaussian surface. And a lot of times in pictures, we're drawing closed surfaces. They're 2D surfaces uh, in a three-dimensional space, but that's hard to draw. So a lot of times you'll see a picture like this, but you have to remember that this is like a spherical shell in three dimensions, and we can only draw a two-dimensional cross-section or slice of this. So keep in mind, you're going to see pictures like this that actually could better be depicted this way. That's a lot harder to draw. I can't draw. Um, so that's the gist of those two sections. And then, um, oh, so as long as the, um, so this E dot A it makes sense as long as that, that uh, um, surface is flat. If the surface is curved, you have to split it up into a bunch of tiny pieces that are infinitesimally flat. So even if you have a sphere, you can break the sphere up into infinitely many pieces that locally look like flat planes and locally have a well-defined normal vector. Uh, and that's that's the point of this equation right here, that you can actually calculate electric flux as an integral of E dot dA, where each small piece of, of, of area is locally flat and has a well-defined normal vector that you can do E dot dA with. Okay, um, the last piece is combining these two things, Gauss's law. Well, we'll talk more about symmetry uh, next video. But Gauss's law is the statement that I made before that, and let me skip to the, the conclusion here. So this is, they're just motivating the main result, but the main result is right here. The overall flux passing through a closed surface, a Gaussian surface, uh, which is these two things right here, flux, the symbol we use phi, and then this is the actual calculation would be the integral of E dA. The flux that passes through a closed surface is equal to the, the net enclosed charge. This is the net charge inside our surface divided by this constant, the permittivity of free space. So you add up all the charges that are inside your closed surface, Maybe the net charge is positive, negative, or zero, and you discard. It, it totally doesn't matter what's on the outside. And at first, this seems really weird, but uh, so imagine you look at this charge that's outside this closed surface. Again, we're, we're looking at cross section, so really this is a closed thing. Any electric, so imagine all these other charges weren't there, and we we're just looking at the electric field lines from this positive charge. Notice how any electric field line that enters the closed surface also leaves, leaves the closed surface. So any charge that's outside the closed surface actually has overall no contribution to the electric flux of that closed surface for, for this very reason. So this is kind of a pictorial proof, but uh, there exists more quantitative ways of, of going about proving this. But any negative flux that appears right here uh, is going to be made up with a positive flux right there, and those two will exactly cancel. Uh, and even when you sum over the whole, the whole thing, this will cancel for that, that charge that's on the outside. So right now, um, so, so uh, you know, th this is describe everything that's inside the, the surface, all the charges that are inside is related to what's going on on the boundary um, of, of that surface. So this is in essence of what's going on with Gauss's law. This, this stuff is on the boundary, the stuff that I circled. And then the, on the right-hand side of the equation, that's what's on the inside. So there's actually a vector calculus statement. It's related to the divergence theorem. There's, there's a whole bunch surrounding it. We're going to use this result in the next video to calculate some electric fields. So, so we'll, we'll pick up more on this uh, next time. For the example problem I want to go over today, I'm imagining a hemispherical bowl that's closed. So now we know what open versus closed is. So we're imagining a closed surface. So there's an inside and outside. In other words, there, this bowl is capped off. 
and there's a uniform electric field passing through this hemispherical ball. What's the net flux through the ball? Well, it has to be zero. All right, so why is that? So the flux, the electric flux is uh, by Gauss's law, this is the enclosed charge, the, the net charge that's inside divided by epsilon naught. And here, there's no reference made to any charges, but we know there aren't any charges in there. And the reason for that is that this we have the, a uniform field. And if there were any charges in there, it would mess up the, the fact that there's a uniform field. So we could have been told, you know, there are no charges inside, but it's kind of it's implied from the fact that there's a there's a uniform electric field passing through it. So there's no charges here. This is zero over epsilon naught. So there's no net flux. So what this is saying that any uh, negative flux that's right here. So there, there's a flat side to the hemispherical bowl. That's where there's electric field lines entering it. There's a negative flux there, and then there's a positive flux from all of the uh, from all the electric field lines piercing through the curved part of the hemispherical bowl. And those two will exactly cancel each other out. They have to in order to satisfy Gauss's law. We can use that fact to solve for actually the flux just through the curved part. So the flux through the curved part, um, flux through the curved part is positive. And the flux through the flat part is negative, but they're equal in magnitude. Right? Notice how all of the stuff that's entering, all the flux that's entering the bowl is through the flat part, and all the stuff that's leaving is through the curved part. So these two are actually equal, this through the uh, flat part. And the reason this is useful to us is because the flux through the flat part is a lot easier to calculate using our definition of uh, electric flux. So the flux through the flat portion is going to be the electric field dot, dotted in with the area of the flat portion. Um, and we're going to take the absolute value sign here. So really that, that dot product, E is pointing to the right in this picture. And A, remember it's the outward normal. A, this, this normal vector would be to the left. And so E dot A would be a negative quantity. But remember, we're taking the absolute value here. Just, just saying that these two are equal in magnitude. Um, so this is going to be, you know, the, these, the, the angle between them is 180 degrees. Cosine 180 degrees is negative one. There's no, the flux is going straight through this, this open portion. So we can actually just take the magnitude of the electric field and the magnitude of the area of that open surface. So this is going to be E naught times pi R squared. Right, it's just the area of this circle, right there. We're not, we're not, we're not focusing right now on the curved portion. We're not focusing on the hemispherical bowl portion at all. So actually, this is the, this is the flux. Uh, this is that that well. This is the magnitude of the the flux through either the flat portion or the the curved portion. And so from this, we can uh, say that the flux through the curved portion is this quantity and positive. Remember, the electric field lines are escaping through the curved portion. And then the electric flux through the flat portion is actually this but negative, minus E naught pi R squared. And then the flux, the net flux through the whole closed surface is the sum of those two things, which we knew had to be 0 just from Gauss's law. OK, lots more example problems uh, in lecture and in the next video. But uh, that'll be it for now.